and welcome to the Animal Training Academy Making Ripples podcast show, the show where we share the stories of the ripple-making extraordinaires with behavior nerd superpowers who make up the Animal Training Academy membership. I'm your host and one of the happiness engineers at Animal Training Academy, Shelley Wood from Drop Your Jaws Dog Training in Cape Girardeau, Missouri in the United States. We are absolutely thrilled and grateful to have you here with us today. Make sure you go ahead and hit that subscribe button so that you don't miss a single episode. This show is brought to you on behalf of the Animal Training Academy membership. So if you like the conversations in these episodes, then we want to invite you to continue them with like-minded people in the ATA membership, which you can find out more about at www.atamember.com. Within the membership, you can get access to twice monthly live web classes, the back catalog of previous web class replays, plus a huge library of videos and projects to help you problem solve your training challenges. And we are a sociable bunch with an exclusive private Facebook group and forums area. It's like a Netflix social media platform for animal behavior geeks. Today, we are excited to welcome Laura Perkins to the show. Laura Perkins resides in Michigan with her husband, two dogs, and two cats. They are eagerly anticipating the arrival of their baby daughter in December. Currently, Laura provides one-to-one behavior consulting for families and their dogs through her business, Laura Perkins Animal Behavior. She also provides virtual services through Kiki Yablon Dog Training. For the first time this summer, Laura served as a TA for Susan Friedman's Living and Learning with Animals course. Laura began training dogs as a young kid in 4-H where she was introduced to what we would call today, quote, balanced training. Her aha moment regarding clicker training and positive reinforcement-based methods was via an agility instructor who used Laura's dog, Sammy, as a demo to free shape getting on the table and laying down. This was the moment that led Laura to pursue an understanding of how this stuff works. Laura graduated from the University of Illinois in 2009 with a bachelor's degree in animal science. She wasn't satisfied with her learning regarding behavior specifically, so she went on to pursue a master's degree in applied behavior analysis at the University of North Texas, where she graduated in 2012. There, she studied with Jesus Rosales Ruiz and was an active member of the ORCA Lab, Organization for Reinforcement Contingencies with Animals. Between graduate school and now, Laura has worked at a doggy daycare, has served as the behaviorist on staff at a county shelter in Oregon, and has continued to grow her business. Laura's hobbies are doing nose work, obedience, and occasionally some at-home agility with her two dogs, Dan, who is a herding dog multi-blend, and Doug, who is a border collie. Outside of dog training, Laura enjoys hiking, gardening, and is learning to play the guitar. Welcome, Laura. We're super excited to have you with us today. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Yeah, I've been wanting to get you on the show for a long time. Um, always love seeing the things that you post in ATA and just learning from you generally. So I'm really excited to have you here today. If we could, let's get started with you telling us a little bit about your background. You kind of said some of that in your bio, but let us know a little bit about how you came to work with animals and um, what you're doing now. Sure. Um, So like many of us, I've just, I've always loved animals. Um, When I was a kid, you know, the first thing I wanted was a dog. and (laughs) um, I got my first dog when I was seven or so. Um, and I got started in 4-H. So that was sort of my like first introduction to dog training. Um, and through the 4-H program, I got connected with some other mentors. So that's how I was introduced to positive reinforcement and clicker training. Um, because yeah, like my bio said in 4-H, we were, we were using a blend of choke chains and treats and praise and tugging and things like that. So, um, yeah, so I was lucky though to be introduced to clicker training. I think I was maybe like 14 when um when I was introduced to that. So I just I realized really quickly how much more my dog was enjoying it. <laughs> um and the lessons we did where we just did clicker training, the dogs were always happy to go. And then anytime we went back to the training building for 4-H, their whole demeanor changed. <laughs> so um 
yeah, so that kind of like showed me like, okay, this has got to be a better way than how I've been doing it. Um, but you know, when you're really interested in animals, everyone tells you, you should be a vet. So that's kind of what I thought I wanted to do. I like, I worked at a vet and I, I enjoyed it, um, through high school. I was just a secretary there and I enjoyed it, but it wasn't quite what I was looking for exactly. Um, so when I was at the university of Illinois, they had a few behavior classes. Um, one was about like training horses, um, one was uh, actually a study abroad I got to do that was um, all learning theory based. And so that was like the first time I was like, this is what I'm looking for. I just didn't know what it was called. Um, and people kept directing me to like more like ethology type um, behavior studies. So like I worked in a fish lab for how stickleback fish breed and I was like, this isn't what I'm looking for either. <laughs> it's interesting, but I just, I was, it struck, it was a struggle to find the name of the thing I wanted to learn about. Um, but yeah, that study abroad program kind of helped. And then my teacher that took us, that chaperoned us on that, um, connected me with uh, Pam Reed at the ASPCA. Their headquarters were in Champaign Urbana, but it was just offices. So um, they didn't have a facility there or anything, but she was there and she was the one that told me to track down Jesus. So that's how I kind of ended up going to the University of North Texas and studying behavior analysis. And when I applied for the program, I really didn't know what behavior analysis was. I just knew that you know, my mentors in undergrad told me this is what you're looking for. And so I went for it. Um, yeah. So that's kind of how I got going in like dog training and then more specifically behavior analysis. Um, yeah. I think that's a story that, you know, I think parts of your story are uh, parts of stories that I hear a lot from other people. Uh, certainly the vet piece, you know, as a child, I was sure I was going to be a vet, you know, um, uh, which was not in any way ever going to be a good fit for me. <laughs> but, but what else are you going to do if you love animals, right? At least one point in time, it seemed like that. And then I think I've heard a lot of people recently talking about, you know, um, trying to figure out how to get to what this exact thing is that they want to do and how how hard historically that has been. But it, it seems like that's changing a little bit now. But um, you're super lucky that you met Pam Reed, who <laughs> connected you with Jesus um, um, and got into that program. Um, I am curious before I have another question, but before I ask that, I, I'm dying to know where was the study abroad? Uh, it was in Portugal. Um, it was just two weeks um, and it was with Roger Abrantes. So he does, um, I don't know what he's up to now, but he was teaching learning theory basically. And um, he was working with a popo a lot, um, the rat, the rats who sniff out the mines. So it was pretty cool because there was a group of us from U of I and then a group of trainers from a popo. And that was the, that was who was there. Um, and he brought, he had like, I think they were mostly his family members, dogs <laughs> that came and we got divided up into groups and taught them some simple things and things like that. So, yeah. What, what kind of simple things were you teaching then? I want to say the one in our group, we were teaching it to back up. Um, yeah, so it was just, it was just a way to practice what he was teaching us. Um, and approximately what, what year was this? I think it was like 2008, 2007. Sorry, that's probably the hardest question anybody could ever ask yeah. me about anything. <laughs> no, like, it's okay. What, it's what okay. year did it that was happen? in undergrad and I graduated in 2009. So I think it was between my junior and senior year. So, Yeah. Very cool. And did you get to learn quite a bit about Apopos while you were there too? Yeah. Yeah. A little bit. Um, it was neat to connect with the people who like, I didn't know anything. I didn't even know it existed before that. So that was how I was first introduced. Do you, could you maybe, I, I would imagine there are some people listening to the show who don't know sure. about Apopos. Could you maybe just briefly kind of explain yeah, a little yeah. bit? So it's a program in, uh, this group was from Tanzania. I don't know if they're in multiple places in Africa, but um, this group of trainers was from Tanzania and they train these, um, I don't, very big rats. Can't remember what species they are. Some sort of pouch rat? Yes. Do I have that? I don't know if that's right. Yes. <laughs> like they're bigger than a guinea pig. Um, 
maybe a rabbit sized. <laughs> so um, these very big rats, but they're small enough that they don't set off landmines if they stand on them. So they're lightweight enough that they can walk through a landmine field and not set anything off. Um, and they train them to alert on landmines. So when they find one, I think they do a little digging and then the, the team can come in and like deactivate it. So they just kind of go through different areas and work on deactivating landmines. And I think the organization now has expanded and is doing some other things, but that's what I know about and what they were doing when I met them. So Great. So thanks for sharing that with us. And um, that's kind of why I was wondering when you heard about it, too, because I I certainly was not aware of Apopos in 2008. So you were introduced to some pretty cool work happening uh, earlier than me. At yeah. Least. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I don't know when the program started, but I think they were fairly new at the time, maybe. Yeah. And, and then when you made your way to graduate school, um, maybe could you share with us a little bit about what that experience was like and what some of your work there was related to? Sure. Yeah. Um, I really loved going to North Texas because it was um, very much what uh, they called themselves a generalist program. <laughs> so the idea was that like they're going to teach you behavior analysis and the people in your class might apply it in a lot of different ways. Um, so there was, you know, there were people who were going to apply it to animals or kids with autism or adults with disabilities um, or in businesses. We had some OBM classes, organizational business management, um, and that's like the application of behavior analysis in a business setting. So it was neat because you got to see a lot of different ways of applying the same laws of learning that we know about from animal training. Um, and so that was one of my favorite things about it. Um, and then the Orca Lab is where I really got to do a lot of the animal work. Um, we, at the time, and I believe they still do, um, worked with a animal sanctuary that was about an hour from school. Um, and it was like a little, like it was a big nature preserve. And then they had a handful of animals that like, for whatever reason, couldn't be released into the wild. Like they were illegal pets that were confiscated, things like that. Um, and so we we worked with them to do some training projects for them. So one of my main training projects while I was there was um, crate training a kawadi, which they're kind of like a raccoonish type creature. They actually are native to Texas on the border of Texas and Mexico. Um, but mostly they live in South America and they're super cute. <laughs> but Cora the Kawadi, I, um, my job was to crate train her. So that was actually like my internship while I was in grad school. Um, and that was a really cool experience. It was challenging because they had to move the animals inside in the winter. Um, so sometimes they would get moved via a crate and it would be a little bit of a setback and then you'd have to kind of work through that again to get them comfortable going in. So, um, yeah, that was, that was a really cool experience to learn about a different species. And, um, it was all protected contact, which was a different challenge from what I'm used to working with dogs. So we had to like get creative about how we would get the crate set up and how we would close the door and how we deliver the treats and things like that. I'm curious if there's anything you learned from that experience um, when you were working with the Kawadis and maybe some, did I get that right? Kawadis and some of the other animals at the sanctuary, maybe some of the things you learned about protected contact or anything else that you learned when working with them that you have applied to your work with dogs? Yeah. Um, I don't, I don't know. I think that some of the things I learned well, really through like the conversations I'd have with Jesus when we would check in on my project progress. And I think the key things I learned were setting up the environment so that it could be successful, which is whether you're doing protected contact or not, that's really a key as we all know. Um, and then also shaping. I think that I really got good at shaping that way. Um, especially with the Kawadi, there wasn't a lot of like prompting we could do. We didn't have like the component skills for that really. There wasn't a lot of luring we could do. I mean, I guess I could have thrown treats into the crate, but um, we really did it through shaping. And so I think that's where I really like 
first started to get to refine those skills. It's really interesting and a couple of really important skills, I think, both learning how to set the environment up for success. And then I wouldn't have thought of what you just said about shaping, but that makes total sense. We have these relationships with our dogs where we have these ways that we just kind of communicate with them and interact with them throughout our daily lives. And I think some of that maybe carries over into training sessions and maybe we lean on some of uh those other kind of communication skills that we have rather than um, just splitting things down and shaping in a way that we might have to do with an, a different sort of species, if that makes sense. So yeah, for sure. Yeah. Yeah. Um, very interesting. And what was your, you referenced your project? Um, yeah, it was crate training her. Oh, okay. So that was the goal. Yeah. We always tried to pick goals that the um, sanctuary really needed for their animals. And I think that every animal there needed, I think that was the goal for almost all of them was to do some sort of crate training because they had to bring most of them inside in the winter. So Okay. For, uh, wonderful. And could you tell us now all of these experiences from um, your time in Illinois in school and meeting, I believe it was Pam Reed with ASPCA and then working in graduate school. Where has this all led you today? What uh, do you do now with all of this knowledge and experience that you have? Sure. Um, well, I went back to dogs. I did a couple uh, inter summer internships at zoos and I really loved it. Um, but uh, just logistically, it was easier to kind of refocus on dogs. And that's what I always was interested in. Um, so I do behavior consulting for families with pet dogs. So I, um, I've, I mostly have done in home in the past, but, um, we have a, we've put up a training building uh, on our property. So now I have a little facility and people are coming here and, um, yeah, so I, we work with all sorts of different things. Um, I know some people specialize in certain topics and I've sort of chosen not to do that for right now um, because I really like the variety. To me, that's part of what's fun is that every circumstance is a little different and sometimes I'm helping with potty training and sometimes I'm helping with like reactivity or aggression. So I like having that whole spectrum. So, yeah. <clears throat> and um, the name and location of your business? Yeah, it's Laura Perkins Animal Behavior, and I'm in Chelsea, Michigan, which is about 30 minutes from Ann Arbor. And you also see people virtually? I do, yes. <laughs> um, so I do a little bit through my own business, but in 2020, um, Kiki Yablon reached out to me and kind of we got connected. We, we'd known each other through other things, but um, she asked me if I would do some virtual consulting for her because in the Chicago area, she was flooded. <clears throat> so, um, yeah, so I've been doing that since then. And I really like that too. It's fun to have, um, the blend of in-person and virtual. So, yeah. Great. And we can link to all of that in the show notes too, um, for any folks who might be interested in, um, finding out more working with you. And I, I agree. I sort of feel the same as you. I can see there are some benefits to specializing and I certainly understand why folks would want to do that. Um, but I think there is also something to be said, um, to a generalist kind of approach as well. So I appreciate yeah. that. Um, what do you do when you're not training dogs? Oh, let's see. Um, well, lately I've been getting ready for our baby to come. <laughs> That's been a lot of my free time lately. Um, but typically like, I really like to garden. Um, I really like to hike with my dogs, but it's, I don't really consider that training. Um, <laughs> and, um, I, last year I started learning to play the guitar so I've been enjoying that too. So Yeah, I read that in the bio and thought that was very interesting. Um, do you have somebody who's teaching you? Or are you teaching yourself? Uh, how are you getting into that? Yeah, um, I have been taking lessons. Uh, there's a guy just in town who, he's a really great teacher. And I part of the reason I was drawn to this was because I, I think as this was actually something that Kay Lawrence said once when I was around her. And I thought that's really cool is that as people who teach dog training or whatever we're teaching, um, it's important to try to be the learner sometimes so that you don't lose perspective of what that feels like. Um, so I remember she was talking about how she was learning glass blowing. And I thought that was like, wow, that's so different from 
dog training and that's really cool. So I don't know. I think there was part of it that is partly the reason I wanted to try learning guitar. And I don't know, it's just something I've always wanted to do, but I've never set aside the time. So, um, yeah, so I've been taking lessons and it's really cool to see how he teaches and the similarities in how he teaches with how we teach and, you know, that kind of thing. And are you learning things um, about either what you were just talking about, what it feels like to be kind of a brand new learner that are impacting the way that you maybe are interacting with some of your clients? Or also, are you maybe learning things where you're like, in addition to like, oh, he's teaching similarly to how I teach? Are there other kind of just overlaps generally with guitar, the skill of guitar playing and the skill of training that you're seeing? For sure. And I just didn't even expect this when I started out. But what I'm learning is a lot like dog training, there's the mechanical skills and there's the knowledge and the understanding of like the music and knowing what this chord is and things like that. But I think that's kind of neat because in dog training, there's a lot of mechanical skills that we have just gotten fluent with because we do it all the time. Um, but then our new students struggle with like holding a clicker and treats and a leash. Um, and for me, like that's how guitar felt um, at first. Just like my teacher could just be like, here's the chord, do it this way. <laughs> I was like, I don't know how to get my fingers on the right strings, even if I can look at that and know what it's supposed to look like. Making my hand do it was um, something I've had to learn. And I mean, I'm, I'm still very much a novice. So like I'm learning that all over every week, I feel like with new things. So um, yeah, I thought I thought that was really neat that there's that like mechanical skill and then also the the like theory or the like supplemental knowledge. That That is really neat. And I do love the idea that you um, were talking about before that you said you thought maybe you'd heard Kay Lawrence talking about as far as, you know, trying to learn something different and something new to always be in touch with what it feels like to be a learner. I don't know about you, but it seems like anytime I spend a lot of time like digging into something and learning it, I feel like everybody else is kind of learning right along with me or something and that everybody else kind of has the same knowledge base. So it can be kind of hard to to back up and teach sometimes from an earlier perspective, if that makes sense. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. So in just a minute here, we're going to dig into some specific training scenarios and hope to learn from you there. But before we do that, some specific, I should say, previous training scenarios. But before we do that, I'm curious if you have any, um, it'll be, it'll be a bit probably, I'm sure. But I'm curious if you have any training plans in mind for the uh, new individual who's going to be living in your home starting in December. <laughs> have you thought about that at all? How you're going oh. to teach a little when new things? Yeah, I mean, I've thought about it a lot. And I have a niece and a nephew. And um, I really enjoy like showing them how to do new things and things like that. Um, but I think so far our focus has been like, how, what do we need to do with our animals to get them ready and our house to get them ready? So I think that's what we're really focused on right now. So, um, and that makes total sense. And right back to one of those things that you said you learned at the University of North Texas, how do you set the environment up for success is kind of what I'm hearing there. Yes. So, yes. Awesome. Well, I'm excited. Um, I'm excited for for you all uh, for the little one coming soon and have no doubt that you are setting the environment up for optimal success. <laughs> You're welcome. I would love it if you would spend a little bit of time now telling us about a training related challenge of some sort that you've experienced and letting us know either how you worked through it or are working through it and some lessons learned from it. Sure. Um, so I kind of two different ones came to mind. Um, the first was a dog. I really haven't worked with her that many times. Um, she was a return client. We previously had worked on some husbandry things at the vet. Um, but when she came back, the, the client wanted to work on just focus on leash walks. And so my first thought was like, oh, well, yeah, that's something we can do. I, we do that all the time. So she brought her dog out to my place um, and we started indoors and it's going pretty well. Um, this dog historically, uh, whether or not food is reinforcing in the moment shifts for her. So I knew that about her already. You know, we were using our like 
high value treats. And um, as soon as we switched to outside, as soon as the dog's feet were on grass instead of concrete, <laughs> um, we just completely lost the skills we built. So she was staring off into the grass and the trees and I mean, there weren't any major obvious distractions, but just bird sounds or like the tiniest little sound of wildlife was getting her attention. Um, and so, okay, um, maybe we just need to take a step back. So my training building has a garage door on it. So we opened the garage door and I thought, okay, we'll, we'll go back to being inside with the garage door open. And there, that's maybe an approximation in between these two situations. Um, but you know, again, she could do it when her feet were on the concrete, we stepped into the grass and she was gone. <laughs> so, um, what, and what we, and you know, obviously the food was not functioning as a reinforcer in the setting. And what we ended up doing was, um, using the opportunity to go sniff and explore as a reinforcer for checking in with her handler and like kind of slack on the leash and looking at her and the behaviors we wanted her to do. Um, and it was really cool how fast that worked. So I think the lesson there was one that I know, but forgot for some reason with this client. <laughs> and that's that we, you know, we want to, we want to know what the function of the behavior is and using the functional reinforcer is probably going to be the most powerful one in the moment. So, yeah. So great, uh, great example of a training related challenge and how you worked through it. Um, how did you get the behavior of focus so that you could reinforce it with going to sniff? Did you start in the garage and then go out to sniff or how, how did you get that behavior rolling? Yeah, great question. Yeah, we did. We started with the doors shut inside the building. Um, we got a little bit of focus and she had some foundation skills, like she already knew how to do a hand touch and a little bit of loose leash walking when there was not any animals around. Um, and so we'd get like just a little bit of that and then um, say, okay, let's go outside and sniff. And we'd take her outside to sniff. So yeah. I'm curious after working through that with her, um, did there ever come a point in time where food became more meaningful for her at all on walks once she had more access to opportunities to, to sniff? I really wish I knew the answer to that, but um, they kind of uh, drifted away after that. So, you know, they kind of, I think she felt like she got what she needed and it was functional for her life. And so, yeah, that was as far as we went with it. Sure. And that makes sense. And I think happen, happens frequently. Um, it just, I don't know what, what, um, what your thoughts are on it. It just kind of pops into my head that uh, maybe now if I can focus and get this thing that I want, then maybe other things also become a little more interesting to me. I don't know. What are, Do you have thoughts on that? as well yeah I think that definitely could be possible and I also think um sort of removing the like fight between the owner and the environment um can allow that to happen so like I think if she's not feeling like I have to keep her from looking at things or keep her from smelling things then that those events are going to be not as like restricted and um, maybe she'll be a little more satiated on them if she gets to do them more often. And so other, yeah, other reinforcers might come into play. I definitely think that could happen. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense to me. And when you started talking and you said removing the fight, I was already kind of thinking that too, right? Right. As you said it, I was starting to think that too, that um, sometimes when it seems like sometimes when we want our dogs to do a certain thing and they're not doing the thing that can turn into this just kind of um, confrontational lock and heels in on both sides sort of thing, um, but uh, a more cooperative approach of um, here's how I can help you access the thing that you want in this case um, might have some 
have some benefits. So Definitely. Yeah. yeah. Wonderful. Well, that's a great, great example. Thank you for sharing that with us. Sure. I would also love to hear about a behavior you've trained or a training situation that you have experienced that you're proud of or that has been re- and or because it could be both could just be one could be both and or that you have found reinforcing. Um, yeah. So I, when I think about this, every situation that comes to mind where I'm really proud of the outcome with the client, um, it's because the client is super invested in doing the work. So, um, I like, I almost feel like I can't take credit for these (laughs) Um, because I think, you know, the client gets that like, this is a process and we're doing this long term and, Um, The dog in particular that I'm thinking of, she came to me that way and she said, I want to do this until we get it. And I know it's going to take a long time. And so I think that that's a lot of the reason that we were able to get success is because she had that starting point. Um, And I think that's, for me, that's been a hard thing to teach to clients. Um, And, you know, everybody's lives are busy, so I get it. But um, this dog in particular, she had worked with other trainers. He's been on medication and she never felt like it was the right balance. Um, He got attacked by an off-leash dog and became dog reactive. Um, And he's huge. He's a Newfoundland lab mix. So he's like 130 pounds or something. Um, so when he reacts at another dog and lunges and barks, it's really scary because my client feels like she can't hang on to him. Um, so they had pretty much just stopped going anywhere. Um, but, uh, I think for him, you know, I've worked with a lot of different dogs with similar behavior issues and similar backgrounds. Um, but for him, we really struggled to find a threshold where, you know, a situation where he could be successful, Um, and so where, where we started was in the training building with the garage door open and a fence in front of it. So he was in the building and I had, um, one of the Melissa and Doug stuffies literally a hundred yards away. And that was where he could be successful to begin with. Um, so uh, that's probably one of the first times I've been able to find that point of success when it's hard to find. Like I think there's a lot of times where when dogs are reacting to another dog at large distances, it's hard to find a setup that where you can start. Um, so I feel really lucky that I'm able to do this at my house now where I have control over the environment and I can put that stuff dog really far away. Um, but yeah, so just starting with that, like really distant approximation, you know, it's a fake dog. It's so far away. Um, but we, we, we've been just slowly, we brought the dog closer and closer at some point they, he could be 10 feet away from the stuffy. So we traded to another dog and so on. And recently this summer we've been doing, um, outings at really quiet parks. Um, and he's been doing awesome. So, I think for him, you know, the thing I'm I'm proud of is first of all his mom, her owner, who's been so dedicated to do this weekly for so long, so that we could work at his pace um, because he really needed very small approximations, and when we would change something too quickly, we'd see setbacks really easily. So. Yeah, I think just being able to do those really, really tiny steps towards the goal. And now we're we're getting there. I think my goal before I have uh, my baby is to get her to the point where she feels comfortable going out into public by herself to practice so that they can keep working on it while I'm not working. Well, that's amazing to have a client who comes to you um, that dedicated and understanding of how long things are going to take right out of the gate for sure. So definitely a good thing there, but uh, no doubt um, she was lucky to have you as well, helping her find where that point of success could be um, and having the environment to, to set it up, which uh, your new space is really cool too. It's been nice to see that coming along online. um, And it's really cool to see that. Um, 
I think that that's interesting. I was noticing a commonality in that example as well as in the other one that you shared about the dog um, who couldn't pay attention on on the grass, you know, yeah. and how important it is to find um, where can we be successful? How mm-hmm. where can we get this going and then and then move from there? So um, you said something like it was one of the first times when you were talking about this story you said it was one of the first times that you were able to um find that point of success like that and i think maybe you meant uh with these extreme reactivity cases maybe is that yeah yeah like i've had a lot of other clients who say you know they're you ask them how far away does the dog need to be so that your dog doesn't react that's my question that i was asked to try and understand where our starting point is going to be and I've had a handful of clients over the years that say, oh, if it, if it can see the dog, if my dog can see the dog at all, it's going to, you know, lunge and bark. And it's like, you, that's not a training situation. Um, <laughs> so um, I think it's just a lot like I, I do feel lucky to have this environment. And I think finding the right place to begin, like the right environment to begin training in is probably the key for for some of those situations. So finding a big open field where you can have the dog hundred yards away um, is, yeah, it's just something I haven't had access to before. And it's really cool how big of a difference that made for this guy. So. It sounds like this owner was on board with um, almost everything and kind of had an understanding of some things right away. But I wonder um, what you just said a second ago, you know, if you've got a dog lunging and, and barking, uh, that's not, uh, I don't remember exactly how you put it, but that's not a, a training space. You know, you're not in a, a place where you're going to be able to be training if the dog is doing that. Do you find that sometimes working with clients, um, they want to know uh, that you're trying to get them to that training space. You're trying to get them to um, that place where their dog is not going to be reacting and is going to be under quote unquote threshold um, and able to be in a training space. But do you find that sometimes clients are like, want to focus more on the yeah, but what about when they do this thing? Does that make sense? Yeah. And if so, how do you um, how do you try to to shape them? (laughs) Yeah. Um, definitely. And also just like wanting to get there really quickly, um, which, you know, it sometimes it is quick. It just depends. It's all at the dog's pace. Right. Um, yeah. So I think I kind of explained to them that those are not, you know, if that happens, especially some of the clients who live in cities, like it's just really hard to completely avoid other dogs. Um, and there's going to be surprises. So I think it is important that they know what to do when that happens. Um, uh, but I always tell them that that is, if that happens, it's okay. You know, none of us can perfectly avoid every dog while we're doing the training. Um, that's, we're all human. That's going to happen, but that's not really a moment to do any training. It's the moment to get out of there as quickly as you can and as kindly to your own dog as you can. So, um, we do a lot of like pretty much every client who has a dog with, with these kinds of behavior reactivities, what we call it, I guess, but I don't know. I try to avoid those labels, but, um, uh, for pretty much all of them, we practice like really quick U-turns and food scatters and things like that so that they have a few tools that they can use to sort of like get out of there. Um, and you know, when all else fails, sometimes you might have to pull on the leash a little bit to get away. And, and that's not something you want to have happen all the time. That's like we're in an over our head kind of situation. And it's probably better to do that than to just let it play out, <laughs> especially if the dog's coming towards you. Um, so, yeah. Yeah, great. I uh, appreciate all of that. I um, definitely appreciate you talking about pointing out that, you know, in urban areas, especially, but also in, you know, suburban and rural areas sometimes, but certainly for sure, always in urban areas, sometimes you're just not going to avoid it. Ideally, we want to be working at a place where the animal is, you know, able to be in a trainable space, but sometimes we, we can't. And um, I appreciate what you said about uh, kind of training, if I was hearing correctly, kind of training for those situations, maybe before they happen, 
with some mm-hmm. things like treat scatters and U-turns and, and that kind of thing. Yeah. Um, and I think it's okay to say reactive um, <laughs> as long as we know what we're, we're kind of talking about. And when I hear you say reactive, I think maybe lunging, barking, panting on leash. Am I on yeah. the right kind of Definitely. track there? Yeah. So yep. it does make it a little Class. easier sometimes. Yes. <laughs> so, yeah, I agree. <laughs> they can be practical, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it can be, can be helpful and practical to keep uh, to keep um, discussions to a reasonable link sometimes to use uh, <laughs> yes. labels. <laughs> Definitely. Yes. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I think I understand it in a, in a similar way to you, but each situation is definitely different. And like the mm-hmm. one that you described, it sounds like that was a more, more intense situation even than some of them are. So I can imagine being very proud of working through that with his owner. Yeah. Yeah. And h- how long have you been working together now? Um, Just over a year. Okay. Very so. cool. Yeah. yeah. And uh, starting to do public outings, that is exciting. And hopefully she will feel confident enough soon to do some yeah. of those on her own. Yep. Yeah. Our most recent one, she was, she told me, I didn't feel nervous this time. <laughs> so I thought that was a big win. <laughs> so, yeah. That does yeah. sound like a big win. Yeah. yeah. Awesome. Mm-hmm. Wonderful. Do you like working with those? Um, just generally speaking, I know we talked about generally speaking. I know we talked about being generalist earlier, but <laughs> do you like um, working with quote unquote reactivity cases? I do. Um, yes, I, I do like them. I I do sometimes struggle and, you know, that's probably something I can learn from other ATA members. <laughs> um, I do sometimes struggle with getting the owner to understand that, it, you know, we have to work at the dog's pace and it's not going to be like I wave a wand and it's fixed. Um, so I think that's when I find those cases a little more frustrating is when people are like, I want to do three lessons and have this fixed and never have to come back to it. <laughs> um And so, yeah, I mean, we always have discussions about like why it might take longer and those kinds of things. Um, But when the owner's all in, I really do love working on those cases because I think it opens up so many doors for the dog and the person. Like this particular client I was talking about, her goal is to be able to take her dog kayaking on the lake sometimes. And she's so worried about what if there's another dog like on the shore or something, what's he going to do? And so I think that's a cool experience. And I, you know, as long as he wants to do it, it opens doors for him and he's going to get more experiences in life because of that. So that's what I like about those cases is sort of like letting the dogs have a more fulfilled life, more, more variety in their life. Yeah. I think there's a lot of value in that and it's an important thing to be able to help people with. So, um, I could, I can understand why you would like that for sure. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, Well, thank you so much for sharing about everything that you have shared about so far, Laura. It's been awesome getting to learn a little bit more about you and from you here. And I think it would be a really good idea. Uh, What you were talking about in the end there, I think that would be a really good idea in conversation for folks maybe to think about having in the ATA community, because I also find it a a real struggle sometimes to... um, figure out how to successfully communicate to clients exactly um, that things are going to probably take a little bit longer than what anybody would would hope they would or how to get them to start at that point of success like you were talking about, you know, and I'm going to guess that there are other folks in that community and probably other folks listening as well who, who have a, a similar struggle. So I think that'd be a great thing for us to maybe chew on in the community a little bit. So I'm glad you mentioned that. Um, before we wrap up today, could you tell everybody again about your, uh, the name of your training business, where you're located, uh, your web URL, the work you're doing with Kiki, um, all of that good stuff. Uh, you're also a TA for, uh, Dr. Susan Friedman Behavior Works Program for anybody who doesn't know about living and learning with animals. Maybe, maybe how about let's start with that for anybody 
anybody that doesn't know about living and learning with animals, why don't you tell folks just a wee bit about that um, and then tell everybody how they can find you to connect with you um, uh, to, to join that program, maybe where you're a TA or to connect with you for your training services. Sure. So anybody who's interested in doing the LLA Living and Learning with Animals course should do so through the Behavior Works website. Um, and I think uh, the next round begins in January. So it's offered twice a year in January and July. It's an eight week program. Um, there's lectures once a week, and then there's also um, a homework assignment once a week. So uh, Susan does the lectures and um, they're live and recorded. So um, you get to tune in and listen to her um, share about the basics of behavior. And um, yeah, so that that's the content is it's sort of an it's an introductory class, but I also think it's something like every single time I listen to lectures, I I learn something new or I remember something that I've kind of like forgotten. Um, so I think it's just one of those things that even if you're an expert, it's probably a good course to take. Um, and then the TAs, our job is to do the homework grading and it's all through the Socratic method. So it's discussion based. It's not like here's here's a list of questions and you have to send the right answers. <laughs> there's there's a question and you provide an answer and then we go back and forth via email to sort of expand on the concepts from that week. So um, that's the TA's jobs. Yeah. Yeah. And um, I've done that, done the program. I've been lucky enough to do the program and then um, audit it a timer, maybe twice, at least once for sure. Um, but it's always anytime Dr. Friedman is talking, if I have the opportunity to listen, I'm certainly going to listen. She is absolutely amazing. Um, but I think possibly... I don't know if it was the most beneficial, I'll say at least equally beneficial going through LLA was the experience with the TAs um, who I got to interact with at that time. So it's just a really, really cool learning experience, getting ready, getting um, the opportunity to interact with uh, the teaching assistants in the way that you do in that course. So cool. awesome. Cool to hear. I'm glad yeah. to hear that you're doing it now. It's a, a yeah. yeah, I'm really loving it. So good, yeah. good. Yeah. Um, um, and then all those other, and we'll link to all of this in the show notes too, but all those other places that folks can connect with you if they want to learn more sure. or work with you. Yeah. Um, I, my website, my business is Laura Perkins Animal Behavior. So um, my website is lauraperkinsanimalbehavior.com and my email is lauraperkinsanimalbehavior at gmail.com. Um, those are probably the best ways. I do have a business Facebook page. Sometimes I'm better than others at keeping that up to date. Um, same name. So you can find that on Facebook. And then, um, yeah, my Instagram page is not up to date. So <laughs> email is probably the best way to contact me if you really want to reach me. Um, but yeah. Hey, well, thank you so much, Laura. We'll link to all of that in the show notes. Um, I appreciate everything that you had to share today. So uh, from myself, on behalf of ATA and everybody listening to the show, thank you so much for spending time with us today so that we can all learn a little bit about you and a little bit from you. Thank you so much for having me. It was a pleasure. We do, of course, appreciate all of you tuning in as well. And if you have enjoyed this episode and are interested in carrying on the conversation about working with the animals in our lives in the most positive, most fun, and most choice-rich ways, then as mentioned at the start of this episode, the Animal Training Academy community is waiting for you. Head on over to www.atamember.com and click on the membership button in the main menu to learn more about what members are describing as the Netflix social media platform for behavior geeks. That's it for this episode, though. Thank you so much for listening. You'll hear from us again soon.